I think, an unparalleled sort of global understanding of our of, of the field of PD research. Um, another wonderful thing about Ben is that he is um, very, very happy to share his knowledge. He's a prolific author. He's written peer-reviewed papers with some of the best and brightest minds in our field, uh, and sometimes sort of provoking uh, us to rethink the way we look um, at Parkinson's disease. Um, he's also recently published a book with Alberto Espe uh, called Brain Fables, The Hidden History of Neurodegenerative Disease and a Blueprint to Conquer Them. Um, so I know we're in for a real treat. Um, I think if we listen carefully, we're not going to just be inspired, but we're also going to get some really good uh, sort of re um, thoughts to sort of shape the way we approach our research. So Ben, over to you. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, and thank you to Joel as well and to the entire TAN seminar for having me here. And for everyone here, uh, feel free to butt in at any point if you want. If you have any questions that pop up, um, I'm more than happy to take a minute and pause whatever I'm talking about. I try to be as open as I can be during any of these talks. So if um, you see something that you want to ask me more questions about, feel free. Also, usually I try, when we could do these in person, it would be a little bit more interactive because I, I always try to time it so that you get to see the kind of two main states of Parkinson, the on state and the off state in myself. At the moment, I'm a little bit too on, so I'm a little bit dyskinetic right now. But I should, if I time things properly, be turning off pretty soon and you'll see me become a little bit more rigid and a little bit more, and you might see a tremor build up in me as well. Um, and if you have any questions about any of those things, feel free to ask or try not to be bashful about those things. But anyways, I'm here to talk to you about kind of the quest that I think we're all on, which is to try to cure neurodegenerative diseases. Some of the problems that I've seen along the way and um, some of the things I think we need to start doing to make sure we have more success in the future. So my story starts in the beginning, like all stories do, with where I was born, here in Nairobi, Kenya. Here I was as a baby. Here are my parents and my younger brother. Uh, but after, soon after I was born, when I was about two years old, we faced a decision about where we wanted to live, where we wanted to be raised, where my parents wanted to raise us. And we decided to pick this wonderful place, Toronto. And I grew up just north of here in Aurora, Ontario. I soon quickly realized that that was a great privilege. Um, as soon as I graduated from school, I had this kind of thirst to go out and see the world. And I think I took pretty full advantage of that. These are all the places that I've lived as an adult for at least a month. Um, and I think this breadth of experience in many ways has helped me in ways that I probably don't even fully appreciate myself. Um, and I've obviously experienced a lot along the way as a result of this, but probably the most formative experience was here in Shanghai, China, where I helped build and run an education consulting firm um, for about six years. But it was also during that time where I got some news that would change everything. Uh, as Naomi said, at 29, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. At the beginning, I didn't think too much of it. Um, I didn't really understand what it was. I didn't know what I was facing. But over time, my understanding grew and grew and I became more and more curious about the brain and what was going on deep inside of me. And more importantly, what I could start doing about it. Now at the time of diagnosis, like I said, it's a confusing period. And it's made all the more confusing by the information that's available to patients. Often we see things like this. Now, I don't know about what you guys think, but I don't think I bear much resemblance to what this classical notion of Parkinson's really is. So I went back in my memory banks and I thought, what do I know about this disease? What came to mind was Muhammad Ali. He was one of my only reference points. Him and Michael J. Fox were probably my only two reference points. And I remembered the uh, summer games in Atlanta in 1996. And I remember watching Muhammad Ali light that torch. Here, here he is. Now that moment, looking back on it, gave me pause because I could see how much he was struggling. I kind of, it's kind of a glimpse into my own future, into the future that in some ways I was doomed to live. 
But like I said, I wanted to educate myself. I wanted to go and see what was out there and understand this disease as well as I possibly could. So I used it as kind of another excuse to go out and see the world. Here are all the labs that I visited or biotech companies or patient organizations that I visited at some point along the way in this journey that I've been on. Now, all of that information filled me with both hope and despair. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. Hope in the sense that there's just so much activity going on in this field. I mean, there's literally patients, researchers, doctors in almost every corner of the planet, all working diligently to try to fix, in some respects, what's ailing me. And that's well represented in this picture here from an article in the Journal of Parkinson's that shows the, just how many different trials are ongoing at the moment. All the different phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials that we have in this disease. And in many ways, this is a strong sign of hope that something is going to strike gold soon enough and we'll have the holy grail, which is a disease modifying therapy in Parkinson's. But also the more you learn, knowledge in some ways is a double-edged sword. The more you learn, the more you realize how difficult this is to actually get through these clinical trials and how arduous the process is. It's basically, and I think this is even underselling it, I think it's really like a 20 year process to go from discovering a target to identifying compounds, to then getting it through all the preclinical and then clinical stuff that you have to go through. And that can be a little bit discouraging from my point of view, because it means there's a huge lag between what you guys do and what discoveries you make, and the benefits that might one day come to patients like me. And really, the shame of it all is, is that this disease is really a race against time. Every day that goes by, I get a little bit worse and a little bit worse. And yeah, suffice to say, time is ticking. This I found to be one of the best descriptions of Parkinson's disease. If somebody were to ask me what is Parkinson's, I would show them this and tell them that this is basically what I experience. Now, this is not what all patients experience. Everyone kind of has a different uh, evolution in some sense to their Parkinson's, but this is pretty, a pretty accurate description of what I experience as a patient. Over time, the drugs that we have, especially levodopa, become less and less effective and come with their own basket of side effects, which you can see in me right now. Um, and there's just, be, there's just a limited window in which the th tools that we have available are actually effective for treating these, this disease. This, I think, strikes at the importance of the work that all of you are doing to find ways to either extend that window or to make sure that this sign, sort of sine wave uh, doesn't continue indefinitely into the future. Now, I also learned that there's kind of a fundamental problem that I encountered at some point. I kind of, I don't want to say I, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a little disheartening, but like I said, all that information can be a double-edged sword. At some point, I came to the realization that medical science just isn't moving as fast as the neurons in my brain are dying. Um, now that was a harsh reality to kind of take in, but it just seems to be the way things are in the world right now. Uh, I wish it could move a little bit faster than it can, than it does. Uh, and I try to do what I can to accelerate that process, but it's still a hard fact to swallow and one that uh, I think patients constantly grapple with. But the question is why? Why is this the case? Now, the question of why, and this is where my background in philosophy becomes a little bit more useful. Uh, the question of why is in many ways a silly question for us to ask. And I'll show you what was actually uh, plastered on the front door of uh, the philosophy department at my school when I was a student. Now, but 
we being humans continue to ask these kinds of silly questions. Um, and I think it's very important that we obviously continue to ask them and we try to answer them from first principles as best we can. I think as often as possible, it's important for people even long into the field to go back to the basics and really try to break down why they're studying what they're studying and what it is that they're studying. What is the problem that we're actually facing? What is it that you study when you study, when you study this word called Parkinson's? And I see the way we've gone about it, the way we've developed our methods to actually deal with it as being a multi-system failure in many ways. Uh, first is kind of an ontological failure. Now by ontology, people usually refer to God and the creation and all that there is, but really it's a question of, is there a there there? Are, is there some, are, do we know what it is that we're actually studying? Are we asking the right questions? Is, are, we, are we guided in the right directions? And all of this stems from who many consider the father of Western philosophy, Socrates, who famously said, as for me, all I know is that I know nothing. And like I said before, I think it's important that we come back to this again and again and again throughout our lives, this realization that we really don't really know, understand what we're talking about and that we need to go back to first principles as often as we possibly can to as our own check on ourselves to make sure that we are in fact heading in the right direction and then have the flexibility to shift that direction if needed. Before I get to that. So I, I ask the question often and loudly and, and more and more vocally now, what is Parkinson's? And I made up this character called William Shakey Spear, who I, who I think would say something like this. What's in a name? That's, that which we call Parkinson's by any other name would still suck. Why is it important to identify what this thing is? What is it that we're actually getting at here when we talk about Parkinson's? I think that this in many ways is the fundamental question that we're grappling with because we have this entire system in place to try to identify Parkinson's and develop treatments for it. And this stamp, this goes way beyond the lab. This goes to every Parkinson's organization, every pharma company in the world. They want to develop drugs to treat the people that have been given this clinical diagnostic label. That's the target for so many of them. And yet, what is it that they're targeting? Is there, like I said, is there a there there? Are they actually targeting anything discrete, or is it, a, as you'll I think, as, I think as you're picking up, are we are we aiming in the right direction? I also see a kind of an epistemic failure. Epistemology is basically how do we know what we know? Now, so much of what we know about this disease comes from the models that we use to try to replicate it. I mean, and in many ways we have no other options. We have to develop models that try to replicate this disease. But we have to be very careful about how we internalize those models and how we interpret what the results that we get from them. And I see a lot of the problems stemming from this route as well. And I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean by thinking about the solar system. This is the model that I was taught, well, when I was in school, we also had Pluto at the end of this. But um, this is basically the model of the solar system that we imprint on our heads and which informs our understanding of where we are in the universe. But this model is fundamentally flawed. And from my perspective, it, it's missing two key ingredients. Well, some people would call them four ingredients, but for simple, for, to make this simplify this, we'll just call them two missing pieces. I'll give you a second to think, and if anybody wants to chime up and say it, what do you think are the two things that are missing from this model? An asteroid belt. Yes, an asteroid belt is missing, but that's, and while that is important, I don't think it's as fundamental to the nature of this model as I'm kind of getting at here. 
Anybody space else in wants? Maybe the space in between. You, I think you're you're close. I think in that regard. What about the rest of the, the rest of the uh, galaxy? Yes, I think that's very important as well. Essentially, the two missing ingredients that I was getting at was space and time. You have to understand, as Naomi just said, where this is in, in the entire spectrum of space. And you have to understand that all systems that we deal with in the world are not static in nature. And when you add those two elements, it changes how we view these things. Here it is. This is a much more accurate depiction of what the solar system really is. It's, we're, we're kind of chasing a ball hurtling through space. Now there's some problems with this one as well, but it's, it's more realistic. It's closer to the truth than the previous image. Um, and I, and this, I remember when I first saw this, uh, it was kind of a, a shift in my own thinking of, oh, okay, we're actually hurtling through this kind of void we call space. And I, I think this does change things. And this is the problem, one of the fundamental problems I see in all of the pictures about Parkinson's and, what the, and how people interpret uh, cell cultures and things that they come across in images. Those static images, I think, are in many ways a poor representation of what's actually going on. Because once you add all of the dynamics that come with being immersed in 3D space and everything that happens as things evolve over time and change their direction, in many ways, I think that would fundamentally change how we interpret it. And if it was possible for us to zoom in and have a video of what's going on in our cells, I think that would, that would alter how a lot of people conceptualize not only biology, but these diseases as well. Uh, and just a couple comics that kind of illustrate this point a little bit more. So how do we, another aspect of epistemology is how we, of our epistemic knowledge of this disease is how we gather information about it. We often wait until somebody's passed away. We open them up and we start digging through the remains of what's left to figure out what was wrong with them. Here's just another funny way of looking at that. Now, I also see this as a kind of categorical failure. Um, now I'm, I'm kind of bending these words a little bit. This, in philo philosophic terms, this refers to the categorical imperative and that's kind of like the golden rule. Um, but I'm gonna, like I said, change this a little bit. So we have these diseases, these degen often degenerative brain diseases, although they're not all of these that I've listed here are degenerative in nature, but I think they all um, fit the point that I'm gonna be making here. We think of them, I think, as discrete entities, or at least I, I think a lot of you might have a better understanding of them, well, far better than I would in, in many ways, but in, in society, we treat them as different things. There's a Parkinson's Foundation, there's an MS Foundation, there's a Huntington's Foundation, and they, rarely speak to each other. Um, and I want, and I'm, it's a little bit better in the basic science, although even there, I'm still amazed in some ways that there's labs devoted entirely to parking. I think there's, we do a better job of it here in Toronto, but all around the world, there are labs devoted just to studying Parkinson's disease as if it is its own entity unto itself. Whereas I think the reality is much closer to something like this. They're all, they all overlap. There's no well-defined boundaries between these diseases. And from what I gather anyways, and I could be wrong about this, but this is just what I, the evidence that I've seen is pointing towards is that the factors that drive these diseases forward often overlap. Um, a classic example is like the CN, C9ORF2, whatever that one is called, that gene, where there's a, I remember there's a study of a family where in one person, in one of the children, it led to 
ALS in another in, in that same gene in the same family in another child led to, I think, some form of dementia. Um, so it just goes to show, I think, that the basic mechanisms that we often associate with one disease or another, I think, have more in common or, or just aren't as straightforward paths to these clinical labels as we would like them to be, which is why I think in many ways we need to step, take a step back and just study these a little bit more holistically without the clinical boundaries that separate them, not only in our minds, but often in our societal structures and in, in some cases, the labs that we use to study them. Another systemic failure that I've witnessed is the incentives that drive research forward. And this is a much better description of it than I think I could come up with, which is good arts law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. This, and what, what is the measure of science and scientists? In many ways, it's your publication and your publication history. That's what often determines who gets grants for their next study, who gets tenures, who gets you know, to speak at the fancy conferences. Most of that is determined by publication history. Not all of it, but I think a large portion of it is. And that skews us towards thinking that science is journal writing or that a lot of science should be, the goal of many of uh, scientific experiments is to produce a journal paper at the end of them. And while that does progress the field forward to some extent, I think because that's the measure that we use to indicate who's a good scientist and who's a bad scientist, uh, I think it skews us and I think it's slow, I think it's not as good as it could be. And one, I think, pretty clear indication of that is this chart. So what it shows is that since we've uh, unpacked the human genome, we're actually spending more and more time studying fewer and fewer genes. There's this bias that's taken place where all where researchers rush towards the few genes that have strong correlations and we are not studying our genomes, which is the base layer of ourselves in as fundamentally holistic way I think as we should be. And I think we're learning more and more that all of the networks that these genes bring up are intertwined. And I think I'm a good example of that as well. So I have a, uh, I have the GBA, I'm a carrier for a GBA mutation, um, which has a strong prevalence in Parkinson's disease. And yet I have no family history of this disease. And I've done, I've had, uh, I've done a G case assay on myself and I found, was found to have normal G case activity, which goes to show that I think me having that GBA mutation might be incidental, might be, have nothing to do with my Parkinson's disease. There's probably a whole web of other factors that we should be looking at uh, when studying these and when deciding which patients should go into which trials. Then there is kind of one of the base layers of science itself that I see as problematic, which is this need in science to isolate independent variables and tweak them to see their effects. The problem becomes when we have more than one variable to sort out or when we have three, four, or maybe even dozens of variables that all contribute to an endpoint. And I think this was put well by John Hardy. Once you've got two or more variables, it becomes incredibly hard to work out what is important. Everything we do is dependent upon solving one variable at a time, which is very inefficient. No one has come up with a better way yet. And the reason why I think this is so relevant is because I'm pretty sure that deep down in my brain, there's far more than just one thing going wrong at any given time. So we need to figure out ways to be a little bit smarter about how we do that and figure out ways that we can incorporate multiple variables into everything that we do. There's also this kind of dichotomy between individuals and populations. We study populations to find out about diseases. And yet I think the more we're learning about, especially these incredibly complex diseases like neurodegenerative diseases, the more we're learning that the, the, they're so individual in nature 
I mean, for anybody who has the chance, I'd recommend going to the World Parkinson's Congress next year in Barcelona. There you'll see about a thousand patients together in one conference center. If you walk the hallways of that conference center, I doubt you'll find any two patients that present their symptoms in exactly the same way. And I'm gonna do something now that I probably shouldn't do, but I'm gonna quote myself from the book that I wrote that you know, we mentioned, Brain Fables. Almost everything we know about this disease comes from studies into groups of people. Those people get plotted as, as dots on a graph. A line then gets drawn through the middle of the group reflecting the group's average. The average becomes the result of the study, an average that almost none of the dots fall on. And to illustrate that, here's another quick comic. The next point that I want to make is that there's, and I'll get through this one I think a little bit quicker, that in recent years in particular, there's been a strong push towards just accumulating as much data as possible and hoping that if we present, if we filter it through clever enough machine learning algorithms, it will spit out new leads that will lead to breakthroughs. And while there is definitely something to be learned from those algorithms, and they have their use, I fear that we're overemphasizing how much we're gonna learn from them. Um, and here's, again, another, as you can you might be able to tell, I use humor to kind of soften these blows. Here's one that I really like. So yeah. Um, I, I won't go too much into this because it'll take me way off course, but it's just something I think we need to be cognizant of as we go forward. And I guess the one point I do want to make though is that we, we can't let, we, we have to leave some room for intuition as well. I feel like in some ways intuition is a lost art in science. Um, while we need to be data driven, we need to focus our attempts by knowing what the boundaries and the limits of our systems and our experiments are. We also need to make room for human creativity and imagination. I think our brains are still the most powerful machines that we have. And we don't know exactly, we don't know how they work. In some ways they're, they're their own black box. But I think that there's a skill that, an innate skill within them, that if we tap into them and if we're a little bit more open about kind of the fuzziness that comes with intuition and inferences, um, I think that we'll be able to make a little bit more progress than we have thus far. Although I know that that's difficult for an empirical study of disease. So, so far it's, I've, it's just kind of been a laundry list of complaints. Do I have any solutions to these problems? Well, I have a couple. Um, of course, these are just my own thoughts on this subject. I'm sure that there are some things that I got wrong in this, but here are some of the things that I think need to be done. One, first and foremost, is we need more patient-led research. A good example of this is this man. His name is Dr. John Stamford. He was a neuroscientist. He studied, um, I think, D2 receptors in mice basal ganglia for 20 years. And then, so he was a Parkinson's expert. He lectured all around the world about Parkinson's until he met his first patient. And he met that first patient in the mirror. It was himself. But oddly enough, despite being a world expert and despite teaching it to students all around the world, he wasn't able to identify the disease in himself. He needed somebody else to give him this diagnosis. And he, I think, is a telling sign of how I don't wanna say like how biased we can all become, but just this constant need to understand, this constant um, uh, drumbeat, I think that we need to realize that we need to have more patients involved in the research that we do. And I know, understand that there's all sorts of difficulties with that, but I think every lab in the world should have a patient advocate that they correspond with regularly, that they go to for advice, 
that they frankly hire as part of their staff, or at least they should have some kind of access to these kinds of individuals. Uh, it will require us setting up training programs for them so that they can learn enough of the science so that they can contribute. But I think that fundamentally it's gonna be important. And here's a good quote from John that I think really illustrates that. Patients have to lead the agenda and be able to say to scientists, these are my priorities and these are the things that need addressing. The idea of scientists alone making the decisions about what they perceive to be Parkinson's is insane. If I think back to who I was before the diagnosis, I wouldn't trust myself to make those decisions. Why is this so important? Well, here's the system as it is. Here's basically, this is a very uh, quick overview and very simplified version, but this is how, in essence, our system works. An observation is made in the clinic. It gets jotted down in a journal. Basic scientists pick up on that observation, hopefully, and they try to study the basic mechanisms. That again then gets put, up, put in a journal. Funding bodies then come along and decide which of these mechanisms is worth funding, is worth pushing forward. And industry comes along and pushes it through that those last difficult hurdles, which is the clinical trial process. Uh, of course, this is simplified, but they're often involved in basic discovery themselves, but whatever. And then the final hurdle is to get it through the regulatory bodies and into people. This is essentially the main parts of the system. What I think we need to do, or what the system, the system as it should be, should look a little bit more like this. I think everything should be centered around the patient. I would go so far as to say that if you, I would almost like every lab in the world to be working on trying to cure just one patient and kind of branching out from there, seeing if we can get one patient better and then seeing how that applies to the next, what we learn from them applies to the next patient. Instead of trying to grapple this monumental elephant that is Parkinson's, which isn't even a single element elephant, it's some kind of amorphic uh, creature. Um, we need to be centering our, I think our, uh, more of our research anyways, around this, the individual person who's actually afflicted with these diseases. Now, how do we do that? This is where things become a little bit more difficult. And, I, and from my perspective, or they require, I think, a little bit more revolutionary thinking about how we design our systems and how we, and it goes beyond, well beyond science to our economies and our social structures and the organizations that we have. And I understand this is very much a utopian ideal, but I think we need to be striving to try to live in the best of all possible worlds. I don't think any of us should be content per se with the world that we live in. I think we should be continually striving to get closer and closer to our, our, our idealized world with the understanding that we'll never actually get there. Now, recently, it's something that I've lately become very enamored with. There's a new technology that's developed that I think has the potential to push us further towards what I think is the best of all possible worlds. Now, I could be completely wrong on this, and if we actually embrace this technology, it could be dystopic in many ways, but I think it could be a change for the better. And what it is, is uh, an embrace of kind of the new era of big data science. And this is kind of antithetical to what I said before, but you'll see, I think, my point a bit. This new combination that's arising between artificially intelligent uh, or artificial intelligence, the internet of things and blockchains. I think that these three elements have within them, and I guess the internet is a fundamental part of that as well, have within them the, the, the potential to revolutionize how we do everything, how we organize ourselves as a species. I see future of research looking something like this in this idealized world. And there's a lot of details that I'm quickly skimming over. I'm happy to discuss them at further length if anybody is interested, but this is the basics of what it would look like. So patients would upload their private profiles and choose what data they wish to share while maintaining ownership of that data. And that 
that last part is I think very crucial to this new system. Right now, patients give away their data to these centralized organizations that hold on to them. They often resell them to other people or they just maintain a monopoly on that data. That or patients lose all control over their identity in many ways and over the data that they created. What blockchains allow us to do in combination with the second thing, which is zero knowledge proofs, is give patients full control over all of the data that they give. Um, now, it, like I said, I'm, I, I can't be 100% certain this is actually a better system, but when, when you really set and think through all the ramifications of what this could allow, I think it makes for a more this decentralized system that does away without these organizations, with these centralized bodies that make decisions for us. I think could really open up a whole new world of discovery and exploration. Um, I just imagine like researchers in a lab in Ghana somewhere being able to access patient data from all around the world. I think we need as many we need to open up the possibility to get as many minds as possible working on this in as many different places as possible. And that's essentially what this blockchain world allows. So I, I won't. I'll, I'll, Kind of running short on time, so I'll skip over some of the other parts of this. But like I said, I'm happy to go back and elaborate on this further if anybody wants. And here's a couple other points about how the kind of economics of this new system would work and how it would actually work in practice. Um, like I said, if anybody wants, I'm happy to go through them a little bit later on. Uh, one key part of this is also smart contracts. Um, smart contracts, which you see here, um, they're going to allow us to do a lot of very cool, very crazy things. Um, I was just talking about it the other day with a couple of friends of mine who were, we were making some wager. We were betting on a sports, some sports outcomes, and I realized just how 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 much better this would be if we just had these smart contracts in place already that would allow us to enter into these agreements. And like, for example, I could have, I guess a more practical example would be, I could have a direct relationship with your lab that allows me complete privacy. Like I could give you a skin graft that you could do whatever you want with, but I would have complete power and control, or not power, but I would have complete ownership of, over that data. And we could securely enter into, into an arrangement without you having to go through IRB approval and all the, frankly, BS um, administrative stuff that you have to deal with. What that, that's what this really allows is it allows for direct relationships between the people who, who need the data to do their research and the people who give that data away. Um, the, the, frankly, the middlemen of science, the middle people of science are in many ways, I think slowing this down. Well, they're important for us to maintain security and maintain uh, protection over patient data and patient information. They are, yeah, it just creates a system that's not as efficient as it could be. And this system would actually be more secure and much more efficient in how we distribute these data and ultimately the resources that come from it. The next thing that I think we need to rethink about how we're doing is the hunt for biomarkers. And this is something that I've borrowed very much from my work with Alberto Espe in Cincinnati. We take these patients that have that we've clustered together based on their clinical labels that we call Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or whatever it may be. And then we, we subtype them often using our other clinical labels like we have uh, PG, what are they called? Like tremor dominant subtypes and then postural instability dominant subtypes and these kinds of things. Again, I think this is the backwards way of doing things. Instead, we need to be going from biology to people. Um, and this is what we're doing in Cincinnati. And I'll try to sum it up quickly. Is we're collecting 5,000 individuals. And I realize that even 5,000 is probably not as gonna be powered, not gonna allow us to have enough power in our data samples to actually be able to do what we want, but we have to start somewhere. There'll be 2000 people with any form of Parkinsonism, 2000 people with any form of dementia and 1000 healthy controls. 
all of them will be de-identified. So the analysts won't know who has what. And instead, we're gonna, they're, they're gonna have to figure out how they cluster together based on all of the sample data that we give them. And we're collecting all sorts of omics data, genomics data, microbiomic data, metabolomic data, lipidomic data, et cetera, et cetera. And trying to see how the biology allows us to cluster them more agnostically than we have before. And again, this is kind of antithetical to what I said before about big data attempts. Um, but hopefully, and unfortunately the blockchain technology is not really there yet to allow us to do this as good as we could, but I, I hope that we'll be able to implement it into future editions, so to speak, of this program. But ideally what that will allow us to eventually do is develop specific assays that re reflect those biological markers that come up that we can then match to specific therapies in specific subgroups with the hope that, I mean, I think we'll get to the point at some point where we have, you know, these, this population of people with Parkinsonism will be able to identify one or 2% of them that have some specific biological abnormality and give them a tailored solution to their problem. And here's what the program is called. And if you want to find out more about it, it's at ccbpstudy.com. Um, we, it's, it, I mean, it's, suffice to say, it's kind of a precision medicine approach to this problem. And there's a lot of, I think, good reason to be skeptical about the potential of precision medicine and how difficult it is that we're, act, what we're actually trying to pull off. But I do, I, I, I see it as the best way forward. Again, I'm, I'm a bit of an idealist. I like to try to live in the best of all possible worlds. Um, and I think that ultimately this is the kind of solution that we're gonna need to really be able to put a halt on many of these degenerative diseases. So that's basically everything that I had to say. Uh, as Naomi mentioned, I wrote this book with Alberto Espe that goes into a little bit more detail about some of the latter things I said. And with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, if you have one, one, I guess the last point I want to make is I very much try to be the bridge between the patient community and the research community. If any of you at any point have any, have any questions about how I might be able to help what you're doing, if there's anything I can do to bridge those divides and try to uh, push forward the research that you're doing as a result, feel free to reach out to me through any of these channels. Uh, and I'll see what I can do. I'll, um, so yeah, with that, I guess I'll say thank you for listening. And I'm happy in whatever time we have left to take any questions anyone might have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben, for a, a very thought provoking, very, very thought provoking talk. The, certainly the first 15, 20 minutes are tough as a researcher to, to listen to, but you know, I think it's uh, it's all stuff that we need to hear and need to think about. Um, I, I, I guess maybe I'll start with a question if that's okay if I take the liberty and then open it up to everyone else. Um, so I sat on the REB for UHN for years and now I'm on the other side of the fence working, uh, you know, often in clinical research. And I, I agree with you, there's, um, you know, we're often slowed down hugely by, by bureaucracy. And when I speak to other patients, they often say, I don't care about my privacy. I don't care about my that. Just, you know, take whatever you need to do the research. But obviously the IRB are there to protect um, patients from potentially being taken advantage of. So have you ever spoken to anyone in the ethics field about, um, you know, your, your perception here? I love your idea of the smart contracts and all the rest of it, but I just wonder how ethicists respond to that. Yeah, and at the moment they're not very um, accepting of this idea. In, in, in many ways they're justified. The technology is still very young. While the potential is there for all of these things that I discussed about, no one has realized that potential yet. And no one wants to be the first to try it also is a problem. Uh, everyone is kind of waiting for some bigger organization to take the lead on this kind of approach. Um, yeah, that, that's the sense that I get from the ethics boards that I've spoken with. I'm trying to get this done in Cincinnati 
and running into all sorts of roadblocks that will might will probably ultimately prevent us from doing it. But um, I'm going to keep pushing regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Frustrating. Anybody else? Any questions? I have a question. Uh, first of all, fantastic talk, Ben. Um, very thought provoking. Um, and just thanks again for, for, for coming to speak to us today. Um, uh, like Naomi, I actually, I think it's a, a very intriguing idea this sort of providing direct links between patients and, and researchers. And I think it's a very forward looking sort of progressive concept. I mean, do you find or think that there might be any issues with the, you know, the fact that most of these diseases are age related and you know the average age of the patient is much older than you are and will people who are older sort of be as receptive to this idea as sort of a younger generation would be yeah in short the answer is definitely no uh they are going to take a lot or, or i agree with the sentiment that you're expressing they're, they're, it's going to take a lot longer to onboard older patients into something like this uh the, and Frankly, the um, user experience just isn't there right now. The user interfaces are way behind at the moment. Even I, it took me a long time to understand this world and to get somewhat comfortable with the concepts and to start uh, trying to think about how to use the blockchains and in these ways. I imagine it's gonna take a much longer for the older generation, but it took them a while, it took them a while for the, to come around to the idea of emails as well, uh, but they eventually did. Um, so it's just a matter of, hammering at home as many times as possible and, and just ultimately getting it to the point where it's easy to use and it's kind of intuitive how much better it is to anybody who like logs on and starts using it. <laughs> Benjamin, this was a great presentation as, as usual. So you, you summarized a lot of aspects. If I would ask you in, in one sentence or even a couple of words, what do you think the major reason or problem is with the scientific community that there is uh, no really a dramatic development in the therapy field? So what do you feel needs to be improved? And I'm talking about the scientific community, which involves clinicians, basic researchers and all kinds. What do you think is still missing here? The amount of researchers or the communication or how would you summarize what is the problem? Or what do you feel could be better? So I, I think 100 years from now, 200 years from now, once we've discovered what that solution is, well, let me say it another way, I guess. In short, I think it's ego more than anything else. Um, I think we all have to realize, and this is going to sound, I don't know how this is going to sound, but that we are part of a collective. Um, while we are, while we all feel like we're individual selves walking through this world, we're we're connected to the history of life, and none of us would be here without that connection. And we all share the same roots. We all come from the same place. We are all very much the same. And we we really need to break down that a lot of the mental barriers that make us think that we are. I don't know quite what the right way to put this is, but that just make us think that I am doing something, whatever that might be. It's not really you as an individual. It's, it's this driving force that's been building from the dawn of time. Um, and you're just kind of on that path. Uh, you're, I don't wanna say you're an instrument, but you're like, you're not, uh, you're not as individual as I think most people think that they are. Benjamin, this is great how you say this. So actually, it, it is like the problem is that everybody wants to solve the problem themselves, so him or herself. And they don't realize that they have to solve it together. So that is a great thought. And congratulations for the presentation. Thank you. Anurag, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, let me unmute myself. Yeah, thanks for that. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I came in a bit late to your uh, talk. I got stuck in traffic. And uh, so I, I, I take it from Naomi's comment that I missed all the nasty stuff you said about us. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed the last part about uh, how you see certain technologies fitting together. And now, I guess my question to you would be, what sort of thing do you see 
that is relevant going forward in terms of technology that, for example, Joel or I or Naomi could employ, because we don't work on artificial intelligence. We don't do these big biomarkers. But if we're working in a lab, what are the type of, if, if, you, if you had all the money you had, wanted today and you wanted to develop out something, what type of technology do you think would be necessary 10 years from now to say, uh, we can fix these problems um, if we had that type of technology? Maybe it's more than one thing that would be important for us to use or think about. Yeah, it's that combination of zero knowledge proofs and smart contracts that allows me to have a direct relationship with you without any intermediary. So that I can come to you, give you my samples in a completely secure manner, and then we can have that direct relationship between the person who has the data and the person who need who can knows how to manipulate and use that data properly. Uh, but actually, at the moment, what I think needs to be done, what I think, what I'd like more people to be doing, is to start the process, start getting comfortable with these new technologies. Everybody's going to need. Just like when the internet came along, everybody needed to learn how to use these things. And yes, you have to wait until yes, the user, new user interfaces will make it easier and easier. But the sooner more people start learning about it and just start getting curious about it and just start watching YouTube videos and reading books about it, the sooner we'll get to that point where we have that direct interface. And we, I, I just see so much room for more efficiency in these interactions. Uh, if we just have that direct link and we don't have to go through university panels and ethics boards and IRBs and all those things. And yet we can still have an even greater level of security and protection in place because of how, because at the end of the day, it's governed by math. And that's really the beauty of these systems is that, I mean, math is in, ineffable science. It's, it's, it's the base root of everything that we are and everything that we, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, it's, it's, it's what allows us to have it, I'm not explaining it properly, the, the cryptographers who develop these systems develop them solely on the basis that these mathematical proofs that drive them are, are much, again, I'm not explaining it. The mathematical proofs that underlie these systems are just much more in, um, immutable than the current way that we do things. Like we have these loose systems in place, these societal norms and rules and regulations that govern how my interactions with you should be. But they're, they're all so flimsy. They all vary from place to place. They're all, yeah, I mean, math is gonna be there forever. These rules that govern the system are just, are never gonna go away. Um, so the, the, just having that security that, that crypto, those cryptographic, uh, mathematical proofs enable is just, I don't know, intuitively just makes so much more sense to me. It's hard to express it, to vocalize it. <laughs> I, I was thinking more on, a, on, a, on a, just a practical level. And that, that is, um, let's say I have to deal with, a pa let's say we, you, know, you have a patient or you, ha you have an individual that you're trying to, s there, there's only a limit of amount of information that we can get from them because we're trying to deal with an organ that is very inaccessible, right? And you know, we can get skin biopsies, but nobody's going to let us reach into their brain and reach out a, you know, uh, and, and so there, therein lies part of that problem is that we can only learn so much. And I, I, that, that's what I'm sort of was hoping that you would sort of, uh, what do you see as a way for us to, to get those kinds of information? So even there, so I'm a, to be very frank, I'm probably going to be going through DBS pretty soon. I want, and I, I would love to be able to demand that a small biopsy be taken, be taken while I do that surgery and given to you, given to like, okay. just extract as much useful data as possible. And I don't want to have to go through ethics boards and IRB approvals. I should, as a human being, be able to have the ownership over the cells in my brain to allow you to, to allow me to be able to empower whoever I want to do what they want, to do what I think is best with those, with my cells. Um, I, I just kind of think our system is crazy that I have to jump through all these hurdles to, in, to enable something like that to happen. So if we had these systems in place and we would very much have to knock down the old systems, which is probably the more difficult part, um, I could literally give you some of the neurons from my basal ganglia and then we could probably push things forward much faster than we currently are. 
Ben, there's a yeah. there's a question in the chat. I wanna I wanna make sure we we get to, and it's um, uh, thanks for the talk. Given your travels, I am curious to know, uh, did or do you see any cultural differences in the understanding and possible solutions to uh, to Parkinson's disease? Yes. Um, one thing I found in East Asia in particular. Uh, here we have a kind of dystopic view of future technologies often. All of our movies have this gloomy sense to them. What I saw in my, in my I spent almost a decade in Asia. Um, so I'm, I obviously don't have a complete knowledge of what I'm talking about, but this is just my own observations, is that they're more willing to accept new technologies. They're more willing to accept the possibilities of what they enable. This has positive and negative aspects to it, but I feel like they're gonna ride this wave of new, these emerging new technologies, which the, the, there's going to be more of an embrace in the society of to, to use these to our advantage. And, and also because they, their societies have more emphasis on mathematics and, and uh, physics and basic sciences. They have a more scientifically literate population than we do. Um, that enables them to, I think, see the benefits, I think, a little bit more clearly. As a, as, a, as a kind of whole organ civilization than we are. Uh, so for those reasons, I think they'll be early adopters of a lot of these things. And some of these things that I'm talking about might come out of there, out of those regions before they come out, of, before they're adopted here. All right, are there, uh, are there any additional questions for, uh, for Ben? And what I'd love, to, one thing I'd love to hear more than anything else, I guess, is uh, anything that you think I got wrong in particular. That, that's what I'm, what I would love to see more than anything else is where, what, what holes in, in what I've said, do am I not seeing? If, and this doesn't have to be for right now. Like I gave my email towards the end of the talk. If anybody thinks of anything afterwards, please feel free to reach out at any point. And I was going to ask if we can get a copy of William Shakespeare to put up, to put it up in the lab somewhere as a reminder to us. Yeah, and I have a couple other quotes from him that I'll send you as well. Beauty, thank you. Well, and then with that, um, please join me again in in thanking Ben for for uh, you know giving up his time and and, and presenting us to us uh, today. Um, incredibly thought provoking presentation, and I, I think we have all benefited from from. Uh, uh, listening to to your expertise and so again thanks thank, thank you, you and thank all of you for all the work that you're doing i mean the the, the future would be very grim if not for people like you for people like me so thank you for everything and uh, i look forward to seeing ways that we can all push things forward and um if there's anything that i can do to help in any regard feel free to reach out we'll do that and i'll make sure that um people have access to your um, your contact information uh, readily. And good luck with the DBS. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Bye, Ben. Take care. All right. Take care, Ben.